Welcome to Embrace Race's Early Childhood Summit, Defending and Celebrating Early Racial Learning. Yes, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to all of you who are joining us from all over the nation and a special welcome to our international friends. We are so glad to have you here and so excited to learn together today. We are your two co-hosts for our summit today. My name is Christina Rosinski. I am the Research to Practice Program Manager at Embrace Race. And my name is Andrea Huang. I am a community facilitator with the Color Brave community, the early childhood arm of Embrace Race. So in case you don't know, Embrace Race is a national nonprofit organization providing resources to meet the challenges faced by those raising children in a world where race matters. We are committed to raising a generation of children who are thoughtful, informed, and brave about race. We support parents, educators, and other caregivers in nurturing resilience and joy in children of color, nurturing inclusivity and empathy in children from all racial backgrounds, raising critical thinkers about race and racial inequity, and supporting a movement of kid and adult racial justice advocates. There is a growing body of research and evidence of children's racial awareness development starting in infancy, and that almost all children develop racial and other biases by kindergarten, and that those biases become fairly entrenched by adolescence. So that data, coupled with current events and the policies and politics of what's happening in schools, school libraries, and school board meetings all around the nation have really underlined the importance of defending and celebrating early racial learning. Yes, and that is why we are so excited to hold this summit today. We have a diverse group of speakers from all around the nation, and they have come to share their stories and perspectives as educators, parents, and public figures in early racial learning. Uh, before we get started with today's program, we would like to share that our summit today is brought to you by Embrace Race in partnership with the Heal Together initiative hosted by Race Forward. And we would also like to thank, we would love to thank our many wonderful co-sponsor organizations who really did an amazing job helping us spread the word about this gathering and some of whom also helped contribute financially. Um, and we truly, truly appreciate this show of support and solidarity among these many early childhood education, parenting and social justice organizations. So our schedule today will be in three parts. We'll have four speakers sharing tiny talks, what we're calling personal, fascinating, narrative style talks, um, a great panel discussion with some exciting guests, and then a reflect and connect session. So an opportunity for you all to engage with us and with each other. And not to worry, we'll have some breaks interspersed with the schedule. If you haven't yet already, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to know who all is here. And I see Chris just put that schedule uh, up on screen for you so you can see when those, when those handy breaks are. So throughout the day today, um, we encourage you to use the chat box to share thoughts and interact with your fellow participants. We would also like to make this an inclusive space where folks can engage across English and Spanish. So we ask that as you do use the chat box, please consider self-translating, which means posting your message in the original language, either English or Spanish, and then translating to either English or Spanish for those who only read one. And you can very quickly self-translate by copying and pasting your message into the translator at deeple.com. That's D-E-E-P-L.com and that is also in the chat box for you. Um, and we thank you for considering that self-translation to help create a space where we can come together across languages. Yes, and again, a very special thanks to Carla and Joan providing Spanish interpretation today for us from Vanta Linguists. If you missed their introduction um, in the first five minutes, please know that you can listen to Spanish interpretation of our entire summit by tapping the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're using a tablet or a phone, look for the three dots that say more at the bottom of your screen. 
Spanish interpretation is made possible today by Start Early, Champions for Early Learning. We also want to shout out Chris and KT from Tuttle Co for their technical expertise in running this long event today. Thank you guys so much for all your work. You guys are great. Well, I think that's enough information from us now. To kick off our summit today, we bring you an opening word from one of Embrace Race's co-founders and co-directors, and one of the funniest people I know, Andrew Grant Thomas. Andrew, the floor is yours. No pressure at all. Um, I will not try to be especially funny. Um, thank you, Andrea and Christina. One thing Andrew and Christina did not tell you is that they are be part of the team of four who not only facilitate our Color Brave early childhood community and its work and do an amazing job of that, but they uh, are also the main organizers of this event, um, which you know you might imagine takes uh, a lot more effort than may be apparent. So thank you, thank you to Andrea, to Christina, Darcy Heath. Uh, and Nicole Russell, uh, who did, you know, the, the bulk of that work to get this together. So thank you so much. I want to join in with them in thanking uh, Carla and Joanne, our interpreters, and we'll try to model, right, speaking at a, at a modest pace so that their interpretation can keep up. Um, Chris and KT from Tuttleco, uh, who've already been thanked, uh, they help us as well with our webinars, our regular webinars. Thank you uh, for keeping the logistics of this together and, and making this a, a good production. Um, and of course, our co-sponsors, our speakers, and all of you who are here, I think we have something like 1,300 people registered for this conversation and many more who will see it later. So. We're really, really pleased about that. And I wanted to uh, elaborate a bit on what's been said already about the purpose of this conversation, right? So why defending and celebrating early racial learning? And Chris, we can go to that first slide. And broadly speaking, I think there are three reasons we wanted to have this conversation. And again, Andrea already uh, alluded to at least one of them, which is that the challenge to racial learning in our schools, of course, is very, very real. It's very serious. It's not new, right? What we've seen in the last couple of years is by no means the first time uh, that people have, some folks have tried to challenge what students can learn, excuse me, about U.S. history and about the place of race and racism in that history, and for that matter, in our present. But certainly it is a more pronounced, more vibrant, more forceful uh, form of suppression of honest uh, reckoning with history and with race than we've seen in some time. So we need to understand it, we need to grapple with it, and we hope to do some of that today. But second, the fight against, I'm sorry, the fight for honest teaching and learning about race and racism is also real. It's also vibrant. It's also not new and ongoing. And third, we can uh, all participate in it. And in fact, we need to participate in it, right? What those of us who are participating in this conversation and the millions more of us uh, across the country who believe, as most if not all of us do, that we it is so crucial, not only for ourselves, not only for our children, but for the future of our democracy to grapple with the reality of race and identity more generally in shaping outcomes for individuals and families and for communities. Those of us who believe that that's really important need to join this fight. And so we're here to encourage you to do that, to suggest some ways you can do that. Um, and to do that together. So first, let's take a look at the fight that's gotten, the part of the fight that's gotten most of the attention. Here are some headlines that, you know, even if you haven't seen this, these particular headlines won't surprise you because they've dominated the, the, the news cycles, right? I'll just mention a couple of them. Georgia Governor Kemp signs a bill into law 
that limits discussions about race in classrooms. You know, the Kennewick School Board votes to protect children from critical race theory racism. Critical race theory flap makes teachers tiptoe on slavery racism topics. And there in the bottom left of the screen, you see some signs that protesters are carrying, right? Stop teaching critical racist, racist theory to our children and we the parents stand up. And I wanna highlight that one in particular because so much of this effort to suppress honest grappling with race in our country and in the schools with our children has been framed in terms of what parents want. I want you to keep that in mind because I'm going to revisit it and suggest this is a complete, um, this is simply not the case, right? But there's no question that the folks who have spearheaded this have made some real progress from their perspective. So across the country, at least 36 states, as of February 20, uh, February of this year, at least 36 states had adopted or introduced laws or policies that restrict teaching about race and racism. Right? And you see that you know, those, those um, states are in peach uh, in this stylized map of the US. And you see that they extend from East Coast to West Coast, from North to South. And there are 36 that have, again, adopted or introduced laws or policies, which is to say they haven't all succeeded by any means, but that's a lot, right? That's clearly a widespread effort. And what makes them so effective uh, in the case of the laws and policies that have been passed is not simply that they, you know, what they explicitly prohibit teachers from doing, for example, but that most of them are written so vaguely that they introduce this real uncertainty among teachers about what they can say and do what books they can offer, how they can respond, whether they can respond to teachers' questions, I'm sorry, to students' questions about race and racism, about LGBTQ issues, about gender identity, and so on. So if you have a lot of teachers who are uncertain about what they can say and not say, uh, of course, teachers are very, very nervous, right? So it has a real suppressive effect. On the other hand, there's another side to the story, right? which is that uh, there's, again, a real strong countercurrent in favor of more honest racial teaching and history. And Chris, we can go now to the next one. So here I've highlighted some uh, fairly recent headlines that, that emphasize the role that students in particular have played in pushing back against book bans, in pushing for more inclusive education, it's students, it's educators, it's parents, right? So Texas students push back against book bans for censoring LGBTQ racial justice issues, for example, you know, or in the top left, these students helped overturn a book ban. Now they're pushing for a more inclusive education. And if you look across the country, this sort of movement is meeting success in a number of states as well. So 17 states, uh, have seen movements, <clears throat> right? As of February, 2022, at least 17 states had launched efforts to expand education on racism, bias, the contributions of specific racial or ethnic groups to the US, I'm sorry, to US history or related topics, right? And if you do the math, you realize that there are some states in which both things are happening, right? So the battle is, the battle is locked, it's ongoing, and how it's going to turn out remains to be seen. And this is an important point. We can go to the next slide now, Chris. Remember that first image that showed parents holding a sign saying, right, uh, parents suggesting that, that this um, lockdown on honest teaching and engagement with the race is what parents want. Well, there was a poll done by Ipsos, which is a, you know, a major and a highly respected polling agency. It's not a, a hack pollster. Just two months ago in September of this year, 
that try to gauge the degree to which parents across the country and people across the country, uh, where they stand, where they actually stand on this issue. First, they asked people, is your own community seeing um, these protests, right? Are people protesting about the curriculum in public schools in your community? Are new policies, are there new policies restricting what teachers or students can talk about in the classroom? Are there new policies limiting what books and subjects can be taught in public schools? And what the poll found is, you know, a, a reasonable uh, minority, a fairly sizable minority of parents responding to this poll said, yes, so this is happening in our community. So 24% said, yes, there, are, but there have been protests about the curriculum in public schools in my community. 22% said that new policies had been introduced that restrict what teachers or students can talk about. And 19% said uh, there had been limits placed on the books and subjects that can be taught in their public schools. It's more than that, right? But then when you look at how they feel about that, and we can go now, right? What they feel about it is this is a problem. Eight in 10, in fact, these are parents, and parents are basically in lockstep with everyone, right? So there isn't much daylight between what parents feel and what the entire representative population feels about this issue. So I'm only presenting the parents here. Eight in 10 parents want teachers and schools to engage students on issues of race, gender, and sexual orientation. So given this, uh, this choice between these three possibilities, what you see on the right in the chart is that 55% of respondents said schools should have an age-appropriate curriculum that includes race, gender, and sexual orientation. 55% said that's what they want, an actual curriculum around these issues. 27% said, well, at least teachers should be able to answer students' questions about race, gender, and sexual orientation. Only 16% felt that schools should not allow any talk about race, gender, and sexual orientation under any circumstance, which is to say that's clearly the outlier perspective on this. And finally, if we look at across, right, this is widely understood to be a partisan issue. But in fact, you know, this poll looked at how Democrats feel about this issue, how Republicans feel, how independents feel, as well as how parents uh, feel. And huge majorities of Democrats, Republicans, and independents and parents say that teaching history of racism helps rather than harms children, right? And you see the numbers there. 76% of Republicans felt that lessons about the history of racism prepare children to build a better future for everyone rather than being harmful to children. So what we should note is at least two significant caveats about all of this, right? One is that the fact that people, what people say they believe in principle doesn't necessarily translate into what uh, they would support in practice. It's a huge and important caveat. The fact that, that parents and others say this on polls doesn't necessarily guide us to what they, or tell us clearly what they would do um, if they were given actual options. The other big caveat is the poll did not ask about when we should introduce uh, discussions of race and racism for children. Right? So it's certainly very, very possible that many people, many respondents who support race uh, talk among students would only support it among, you know, let's say high school students, not middle school and not elementary, much less preschoolers. And still, this is a different story than the headlines have been telling us. Now, here's the last point I'd like to make. I love this quote from this political scientist, E.E. E. Schatzneider, uh, which is one of the, the takeaways I have from my graduate school career many, many years ago. And he said this, if a fight starts, watch the crowd because the crowd plays a decisive role. 
he was talking about politics. And what he was saying is, excuse me, when a political fight starts, you need to be aware uh, of what all the rest of us do who are not, as it were, immediate combatants in the fight. What is it that we do? How do we weigh in? How many of us weigh in at all? On what side? How far does the fight spread beyond the initial combatants? These, uh, it seems to be the case that most parents are supportive of teaching kids about school, and yet the parents who are not supportive, who want to suppress that teaching, seem to have the upper hand in terms of legislation and so on right now. Why is that? Because that side of the issue has been able to mobilize far more of its people than the side of the issue that is really concerned to teach more honest history. We need to weigh in. And over the course of this next uh, few speakers, you will hear much more. Um, and you will hear ways in which we can weigh in. So please join the fight, weigh in, and I hope you enjoy the next few hours. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Andrew, um, for helping us ground ourselves in this moment in time in the US context. And I know we'll hear a little bit more about that from our first speaker in a few moments. And I personally really appreciate highlighting the positive movement of many people out there who want to expand and encourage healthy developmentally appropriate uh, teaching and learning about race, even among our youngest learners. And we hope that everyone here today will be inspired, motivated, and encouraged by our speakers to continue taking action to celebrate and defend healthy teaching and learning about race with our young children. Yes, and we really wanna encourage everyone today to not only be inspired, but also to commit to taking action. So here are three ways, you'll be able to see that on your screen to do so. So the first way is to join the Embrace Race community. One of our primary goals is to provide space for folks to find mutual support in caregiving and parenting, in teaching practices, and in advocacy and activism. I can't highlight enough the need for community when doing this work. You need people around you. So to let us know who you are and to find ways to stay connected with Embrace Race, you can click the link in the chat box and fill out a quick form letting us know how you'd like to be involved. And another easy way to show your commitment is to join the Heal Together initiative hosted by Race Forward. And as Andrew pointed out, students, parents, and educators are helping their communities come together to support honest, accurate, and fully funded public education. Through partnering with community-based organizers to better connect communities and build power, the Heal Together initiative works to counter the anti-CRT movement impacting our schools while advancing a vision of a just multiracial democracy that works for everyone. So to support and learn more about the Heal Together initiative led by Race Forward and their core partners, the NYU Metro Center and the Schott Foundation for Public Education, please click the link in the chat box or copy and paste that link in the chat box um, to sign their pledge and their commitment to community-based organizing. Ah, the links are working now. And lastly, here at Embrace Race, we believe that taking action isn't only just joining the national conversation, but doing something local and getting involved. So there are a myriad of ways to support early racial learning at a local level. And we encourage you today, as you listen to our wonderful speakers and panelists, to think about how to do that and commit to getting involved at a local level in your community.